Okay, go ahead. Hi, good morning. Uh, welcome committee members, liaisons, and members of the public to the Partnership Grants Committee meeting. Thank you for joining us. We will begin now <laughs> shortly. Uh, we are using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you'd like to comment during the meeting, please type I have a question or have a or um, I have a comment in the chat and a message will be sent to the host. Alternatively, you can use the raise hand feature. In efforts of transparency for all those joining this public meeting, whether by phone or Zoom, we request that you refrain from having side conversations on chat about the content of the meeting. Again, the chat feature is utilized simply as a tool for you to virtually indicate that you'd like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. Uh, new going forward, all uh, trust fund commission and committee meetings will be recorded and posted on the state bar website. A friendly reminder that this is a video conference and please be aware of your surroundings behind you. A few troubleshooting tips uh, for those using Zoom on a computer, when on mute, holding down the space bar will temporarily unmute yourself. If you use your phone to dial into this meeting, please be sure your computer's microphone is on. On mute to avoid feedback, audio feedback issues. And while joining audio via computer is highly recommended. If an individual loses audio, they can call in separately using the Zoom conference number. Thank you, Crystal. Would you please take roll? Sure. Uh, Christina Venerelli? Here. Kim Bartleson? Will Bichelli? Present. Eric Iskin? Here. Chris Schreiber? Here. Here. Right. And we do have quorum. Oh, sorry. In terms of our advisors, um, Judge Jaskel? All right. Justice Murray? Um, and then our liaisons, um, I believe Mel Melanie Snyder's on here. Yes, hi. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Save our staff, uh, Elizabeth Palm. Here. Erica Carroll. Here. Great, thank you. And Crystal's here, obviously. Right now is the time to call for public comment. Are there any members of the public on the call that would like to identify themselves? I don't see any, I don't hear any. So let's uh, move forward. Before moving on to agenda item three, Crystal has an update to share with the committee. Sure, so this was an update provided from our executive, interim executive director, um, Donna Hershkowitz. Um, on June 10th, the 2021 to 2022 budget bill went into print. SB 112 contains new funding for legal services projects to be administered by the State Bar's Legal Services Trust Fund Commission. SB 112 includes a $50 million increase to the Equal Access Fund. Uh, Five million of that is for <clears throat> infrastructure innovation grants to be administered by the California Access to Justice Commission to civil <clears throat> legal aid nonprofits, including but not limited to those funded by uh, the State Bar's IOLTA grants. It, expect, it is expected that this $50 million increase will be uh, reduced to a $20 million increase after that first year. Um, in addition, 40 million per year for three years for homelessness prevention. Um, just as a note, um, since SB 112 has not yet been approved by the governor, this update will not impact uh, the committee's funding recommendations today. We may need to schedule an ad hoc meeting in July to make any adjustments to the uh, recommendations. So at this time, I'd like to, um, I guess, uh, poll the committee in terms of availability. We are looking at late July, so the week of July 26 for a uh, two hour meeting. Um, does everyone have access to their calendars or I, I can uh, send a doodle poll after this meeting um, in terms of availability? I mean, I'm pretty flexible that week. Um, uh, you, you might want to send a doodle poll. Well, I don't know. I'm pretty flexible the, that week at the, the moment. The date I was looking at, or one suggestion uh, proposal is July 30th. Uh, that's the Friday, um, similar time, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. I'm a maybe that day. Um, that's, um, yeah, that might it, be. Yeah. Okay, it, it doesn't have to be a Friday. It could be any day of the week. It's pretty flexible now. Um, Wednesday or Thursday, and from 28th or 29th, any, uh, any other conflicts on those days? Thursday is better for me. I could make Wednesday work, though. How does Thursday, uh, July 29th, work for everyone? Fine. Fine. Okay. For me at the moment. 
I'm sorry, sorry, Crystal, can you, um, could you say again what this tentative meeting, what this might be for? Yeah, you sure. talk pretty so, fast. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Yeah, so it's a potential um, increase to the EAF, um, EAF funds. So because the partnership grants, you know, 10% is allocated towards partnership grants, this would then in turn, you know, potentially increase the EAF pot. Um, for 2022, uh, still, that's still to be determined, um, but I just wanted to get a date on calendar in case we needed to make any adjustments before the August Trust Fund Commission meeting. I don't know, Vaughn, if you wanted to share anything else uh, in terms of this update. No, I think, uh, I think we'll know in a couple of weeks for sure um, where we're at. Uh, we'll definitely want to see what the governor actually signs, but it is, I, to my mind, it really is an opportunity for the partnership grant committee to, and the commission itself to really rethink some of the parameters so that we've put on the grants over the years because you know it was based on how much money we had but you know things like saying we're not going to give over a hundred thousand dollars if we have you know two four million more then we can kind of open that up you know and some of the we're only going to fund this tiny little part of a project i think if we open it up to the programs and say hey this is your opportunity you know just as we've tried to do with some other projects, you know, this is your opportunity to do something pretty meaningful. Um, I think it. I think there are amazing opportunities, and it will mean a lot of conversation with the programs and also with the courts, right? Because it's it if we, you know, and and also to my mind, it's really going to matter how much we get one year versus you know if it's ongoing, right? Um, but we've tried really hard to say, if we can't spend all the money, let's just get it back into the formula pot so that we don't lose it and that we're not, um, but you know, if we get like, if we had $7 million, or, you know, let's just take a number $7 million. So it's like, <laughs> for one year, like a one year project, that's, that's possible. <laughs> don't want to say it's impossible. Could do some big, tech, whatever thing, but it's not, if it's not on the long, you know, what we know is that most of the work that our folks do is the actual direct service provision, incredibly valuable work. And that you need to be able to guarantee people, or at least give them some sense that they're going to have a job longer than a year. Well, do you think it would, um, I mean, I think it's great news, first of all, yeah. that's awesome. Um, but, you know, if we're looking at potentially several million dollars more of money, partnership grant money. I, I'm just trying to think about how we want to, how, how you're envisioning this. Are you thinking we would meet on the 29th and make decisions right then about spending an extra $2 million or would there be kind of a process that, well, here are some options and we'll come back. And, yeah, know, I, I think, know. I think uh, Eric, I think um, staff will talk to uh, Bonnie, um, judicial council staff and we'll come up with a plan um, because, um, because, it, the situation with the budget has been so fluid. Uh, we we um, just, you know, we just don't know what, what will ultimately be signed. And so um, we've had some preliminary conversations, but I think once we know for sure, we'll, we'll do some planning with judicial council. And then um, in the July meeting, we'll, we'll come up with um, a recommendation and some options. Okay. Yeah. But things like the adder near the court, you know, we could do more of the kind of remote ideas, mm -hmm. you know, where you could have, an organization that's really great at a particular topic that, you know, is which we've done, we've tried to do in the past we, with um, Betsetic with their um, limited conservatorship project, you know, where they could help in other counties with technology now, maybe that kind of thing could work again where, you know, everybody could just like, you know, let's start it on the computer and then, you know, be connected with Betsetic who's based in LA, but, presumably would know how to do things under the counties. I mean, there are all kinds of things that you could do, right? That would be, I think, I think, you know, really exciting. So yes, please, you know, I think you're, if you don't mind, please also be thinking about um, based on your review of these proposals over the years, um, you know, what you, what you think would be really helpful. And I will also just share with you that Los Angeles, um, you know, gets a you know, has, as you know, has a lot of, of self-help centers that are primarily staffed by legal aid and um, serve a ton of people, ton, a ton, a ton of people and are, you know, could, you know, likely come in with 
uh, a request for additional staff and, you know, and that could, that could potentially be a big ask. So anyway, so I just think just, as I say, for all of us to really be thinking about it, it's such a different world than um, I've had the opportunity to think about, which is kind of exciting. Yeah. Oops. Anything else on that? Summarize, I just want to make sure I understand. The, it would be an additional 5 million for 2022 and, or some amount around there and we'd be trying to distribute that in the 22, 22 grant year? I, I think we, I mean, I, the, the update in terms of SB112, like we, I don't know the details yet in terms of the distribution and limitations and you know how much needs to be spent on the certain year. Um, so I think we'll should communicate, we can communicate any updates via email as soon as things are final. Um, I don't want to confirm anything um, and then it ends up being a smaller amount or it doesn't get signed. So um, we'll confirm once, you know, uh, the governor takes a look uh, and, and can, can kind of iron out those details and communicate the plans with uh, following up with organizations and the applicants this year. Yeah. That, that sounds great. I wasn't trying to confirm the amount. I was trying to yeah. confirm what was the, the gist of it, but that, I think I got it. Thank you. Okay, and then so we'll tentatively have July 29th on, on the calendar in case any of the amounts, you know, additional amounts needs to be distributed in 2022 as a, yeah. Great, thank you. Crystal, did you mean to share your screen? Um, I can, or not. it was just, it was nice seeing people's faces, so. Oh, okay, I, I didn't know, you, you can decide. Um, okay. So the next item is the consent item to approve the meeting summary and action items from May 7th, 2021. Are there any comments on this document? I move that we approve the summary. Okay, thank you, Eric. Do we have a second? Second, yes. Second, Will. Can we have a roll call vote? Sure. Um, Vanarelli? Yes. Bartelson? Michelle Lee? Yes. Biskin? Yes. Schreiber? Yes. Great. Motion carries. Motion passes. Okay, the next item, uh, action items. First, discuss and approve the 2022 partnership grant funding recommendations that we had for um, from last from our work last month. So Crystal will lead that discussion. Great. So let me go ahead and share my screen now and we'll advance the slides a little bit. Yeah, so the agenda item for this meeting um, just highlighted the updates um, specifically regarding responses received from applicants. Um, staff did reach out after the May 7 meeting to all applicants to share the final rubric scores as well as the tentative funding recommendations. Um, there were no follow-up questions regarding the rubric scores um, or the updated review process, uh, which was highlighted in the memo. Um, one of the attachments to, to today's memo um, was responses from 15 projects. These were specifically projects with tentative funding recommendations that were less than the requested amounts. Um, those projects indicated that due to the decrease in funding, um, there, there may be, they may need to revise their application um, to reflect uh, reduced del deliverables. Uh, generally, those that reduction in, in deliverables were in proportion to the decrease in funding. For example, um, like a 10% cut to the requested funding would also be a 10% cut to the um, service goals uh, and, and, other, and other elements. So in looking at the responses received from those projects, um, I think staff's recommendation for now was to not make any um, updates to the tentative funding recommendations uh, made on May 7th, keep them as is just because it was, a, I, in terms of the process and the approach, I think utilizing the uh, scoring rubrics, the scores, uh, as well as looking at the areas. And I think we did kind of several filters and kind of a systematic approach on how to make the funding. 
I think Sackville is pretty comfortable in terms of moving those tentative recommendations forward. So Crystal, can I make one comment? Mm -hmm. um, I looked at the recommendation, the comments, just I didn't study them that carefully, but I, and I agree mostly with what you just said. There was one project though, Riverside, small estates <laughs> that um, had more dramatic comments. <clears throat> I mean, they talked about the uh, <clears throat> reduction having the way I read it anyway, having a pretty significant impact on what they could do. They were talking about not having any paralegals, not being able to do any paperwork for clients. I mean, that one seemed, you know, I think we should think about that one a little bit. And in terms of Riverside, um, you know, just in terms of the scoring rubric um, to note that they did receive the lowest score. And um, Dan and I both reached out to Riverside and tried to get some additional information um, that maybe was not included. Um, in terms of the information provided, th there wasn't anything, I think, based on that conversation that, um, you know, unfortunately, I don't want to say like it wasn't persuasive enough, but to, to help support no, no, it. I, 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 actually, yeah. my, comment, my comment was going the other way. It was not, I wouldn't give them more money. I was thinking, you know, oh, you why bother? Even, <laughs> why, yeah, in a way. I mean, <laughs> They're almost, I mean, it, it was not an impressive project and they're almost saying like, well, we're going to have to not hire a contract attorney. We're not going to do any paperwork. I mean, I just yeah. wonder whether we shouldn't just, <laughs> just take the funds and redistribute it. Please, please talk about it. Yeah, I would concur with Eric on this. When, when it says all of the things that he's mentioned and their bottom line is this cut would significantly reduce our services, I'm unclear of the relationship there and why this $30,000, which is actually 10,000 less than they requested that when they, in their comments, uh, yeah, what is the deal there? I, Do we I have like any indication why this particular program losing, well, only having $70,000 it seems to indicate that they're going to eliminate most or all of their services. In terms of the decrease in funding, I, I think that was related to the paralegal salary um, uh, is my, my guess. Well, they, um, they also said it would eliminate their ability to do any paperwork for any clients at all, um, which is a huge part of probate, which they didn't mention. Um, and that an attorney, their direct quote was, an attorney giving legal advice is not enough guidance to litigants in getting their documents done correctly. So then what is this program accomplishing is my question at that point. Yeah. I, I, don't, um, I don't know. I mean, I think the organizations were all trying to advocate for themselves, but I, I don't know this specific commentary um, hurt, hurt Riverside, uh, mm -hmm. ultimately. Um, I don't know, I will, I'll defer to the committee in terms of you know, whether or not this impact with, with the decreased funding, you know, I guess thinking, thinking wide, we haven't necessarily not funded, a, maybe it's been a while since we haven't funded a project, but is, is this enough to, to potentially redistribute those funds um, elsewhere? It's what, $30,000 or something like that? Um, I will pull up the, um, oh, the spreadsheet right now. 70, right? No, but I think we actually recommend, they wanted 70. I think we recommended like half of that or, oh, oh no. You're right. They requested 110. You're right. If, if I read it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying. If they're not going to have paralegal services and not going to be able to do documentation, what's left? I think that's exactly my question, <laughs> Christina, is this, what are we funding if that money could go to other programs? Um, I would like to believe that they're going to do their best to serve as many clients as possible and that they will be effective in, in serving those clients. But I can't ignore their response, which seems to imply that they won't be able to do 
much of anything. But maybe there was other discussions or revisions in their numbers that would give us more insight here. They, in terms of our conversation that we had with with executive director, um, the, I, I, I can say if they 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 um, if those would be uh, need to be updated. My guess is is yes, um, but now I, you know, I I see what the committee is, is saying. Um, I guess, what are our options in terms of getting clarity from them uh, prior to next week's meeting? Is that impossible? Do we need to make a decision right now in terms of the recommendation? Yeah, today was is, is kind of the designated time to, to finalize the, the recommendations, you know, pending, you know, if, if we do have the July meeting, um, you know, because potentially there could be additional funds that could, could fully staff, potentially full, um, fully fund some of these grant awards, et cetera. Um, and I think um, when Dan and um, Crystal spoke with um, the ED of Riverside Legal Aid, they did let her know uh, that if she wanted to make public comment at today's meeting, she was welcome to. Um, and, and what she ultimately did was just submit the written response that you all read. That's uh, certainly disappointing that uh, she could not be here. I mean, I guess the I mean, the option is to, to redistribute, to, to yank the money, not not to fund them, and, and redistribute to possibly potentially other more worthy projects. <clears throat> Which I know sounds kind of harsh. Maybe we shouldn't do it, but I must say the response was not not impressive. In terms of monitoring their commitment uh, throughout the year, we'll be able to see that they are following through, that something is getting done, this money is being used properly, right? So we get, um, in terms of evaluations, it's it's at the end of the, the term, the course. I, I don't know, Elizabeth, if you can okay. do periodic check-in, I don't know if that'd be within what we would, uh, what we could do. Um, that's not typically something we would do, but if the committee um, thinks that that's something, uh, a prudent thing, we can um, uh, integrate that into the process. Is, um, is there a way to attach a condition on their funding that they provide us with an updated application? Uh, be before we... Um, before you distribute the money to them? With an updated application with like updated deliverables, is that what you're? Yes. You would like? Yes, that is that is satisfactory to the committee, or the commission. However. Um, sure. So then, because um, I think um, Crystal, can you remind me? Is is approval of these recommendations scheduled for June or for August? June twenty five. Okay, for, for next now. week. Okay. I believe, I mean, I think mm -hmm. they could make the revisions within the week. Yeah, it's, I, yeah. I guess, to, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so I think, yeah, if we will reach out to them today or this afternoon um, and, and try to get that information. Well, so then what are we going to do today as far as a decision? So assuming that, you know, they revise the application with deliverables that seem reasonable given given the reduction in funding, um, would, would the committee be comfortable approving what has already been um, uh, determined uh, their allocation award? I would be. Well, can, can, before we kind of answer that question, can we just take a brief look, just scan the list briefly to see what other projects we, we reduced that we think were really great? And at least think about whether we don't want to redistribute the Riverside money to those projects. Um, Would it be easier to, to sort by? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, by high to low or yes.
I'm going to scroll down the higher ones because I think we might have fully funded. <clears throat> a pretty big cut San Diego volunteer lawyer program I didn't review any of these so I can't pound the table and say we absolutely should give them money then Central California legal surf well we didn't cut them too much can, can you tell like I think there's I don't know I'm thinking about this in two ways what would happen to staff and what would happen to services mm -hmm. and, and especially so, in, in Riverside County yeah so do we, I mean, to be honest, it, it sounds like there's not going to be a big hit to services because they didn't really, they, like our question as a committee is about, is about whether these services are going to be delivered. And if so, whether they really rise to the level of any kind of funding, unless I'm misunderstanding the committee's no, I think you're right. I, that's that's the concern. And by the way, on, on staffing, Chris, I, I think the staffing is a contract attorney. Right. So, I, I mean, I guess like I, this is how I'm thinking about it. I, this is not the right, objectively right way. This is just how I'm doing it. But if we're, you know, the committee is trying to be both humane and also uh, responsible. And so we don't want to be draconian. And so the way I'm, but we also want to hold them accountable. If we're less concerned that there's going to be some big diminution in the services that are being delivered, because this money is just not going to be deployed as effectively given the limitations, then we really aren't affecting the people who need the services. The next question to me is, well, what happens if this money goes away? Who, what does the organization do in terms of staffing? And it sounds like this is work being done by a contract attorney. And I guess the question is, does that contract attorney get redeployed in some fashion um, or lose his or her job? Um, and if so, you know, like, are we chasing somebody out of legal services because of the instability of the funding? So that's my sort of way of thinking about this. I guess I'm not hearing anybody really saying that the services are really going to be missed because they can't really deliver what we want them to deliver. But I'm not so clear about what's gonna happen on the employment front. Their budget has $15,000 for lawyers, paralegal at 38,000. So it looks like the paralegal is doing most of the work and they're saying they've got to get rid of the paralegal if we only fund them at 70. So. So really you're saving a paralegal's job here by yes. getting the money. Um, yes. But the paralegal is already limited in terms of the services that can be provided. Am I understanding that? should be i feel like this money's it i mean how many bites of the apple did they have to justify the funds two or three uh are you asking how many times staff talked to them mm -hmm. i mean in terms of we had the the letter or sorry the notification um dan, dan and i's conversation i think dan has been working with um uh, with with the ED um, prior to that to try and get better uh, clarity in the application um, that was also specifically you know done for Riverside because I know he had some concerns during during review and when the review team looked at the application so I, I would say more than two staff have a recommendation I have, I have a like an opinion, but I, it would be influenced by staff's humanity. Well, um, be because this is in Riverside, which which is an area that um, needs legal services, even if they're not 
as high of a caliber or um, all that you know this committee might expect. Um, I I think you know at this juncture it it would it would be using Chris's word humane um, to to leave the allocation recommendation as is. Um, but that's just my opinion. And I, I would say and I appreciate that, Elizabeth. But we it's not like this is the only funding stream going to the Indian. No. We've got other other funding. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It is the only partnership grant, though, I believe. On Riverside in this county. I mean, can, can, you, can, you, can you share the comments they made? Can you put that on the screen, Crystal? Yeah. And just be reminded of them. If I could chime in. Um, I, I agree with what Elizabeth said there. The question, based on the remarks, is whether the needed legal services will be provided in a meaningful way. So as a, as a matter of process, I feel like cutting their funding today without giving them a chance to respond would probably be unfair, but I, I really dislike, based on the response, uh, funding them when it's really unclear to me that the legal services will be provided. They were toward the bottom. Yeah. And just to respond to Will's comment, I, I, I would say, you know, if, if the committee, you know, decides to approve the um, allocation um, or the recommendation, rather, uh, we could go back and let them know that, the, you know, the committee did spend some time today discussing it and we're concerned. And, you know, the expectation is, you know, we would see uh, in the evaluations, um, you know, progress. Um, um, and, and that we would want them to update their application to, to um, uh, accurately reflect what their deliverables would be. Yeah, I, th I think that might be a, a good starting point because if they say they're going to cut the paralegal and if the paralegal's doing most of the work, I'm, I'm just confused, honestly. Mm -hmm. Budgeted thirty-eight thousand for a paralegal and fifteen thousand for an attorney. We're giving them seventy thousand. I mean, we've got some overhead, but I don't know. It doesn't seem right to me. I would redeploy the money. But that's just my view. I'm happy to be guided by whatever everybody else wants to do. That's my instinct. Um, so I will pull, shall I pull, shall I pull up the spreadsheet one, once again? Is, is, is your decision impacted, would your decision be impacted at all with the knowledge that there's likely going to be another 2 million at least available for partnership grants or does that not factor in? How, how would that cut? So that would be another chance for them to maybe submit a better application? Potentially. Yeah. Then I would definitely redeploy this. Yeah, me too. Yeah, that's a good idea. Because I, my mm -hmm. opinion on this is like, we demonstrate over and over and over again our interest in making these things work we were very transparent with them about what we needed. And then they just, yeah, and I, again, very sympathetic, but they just did not provide what was the information that was needed to generate the level of comfort. Uh, I mean, I feel like they're, you know, they've got a lot of orders pulling in the same direction. And they don't need to pull that hard. <laughs> so, you know, when, when a program really doesn't, it's, it's frustrating because, you know, help us help you. But I, again, I don't want to be inhumane, but. Yeah, I, I really strongly agree with everything that's been expressed by Eric and Christian. Uh, my, the only reason I would not redistribute uh, personally this time is just a process. We gave them the tentative funding number 
Um, and they probably had the expectation that that's what it's going to be. And if we told them that we were going to cut it all the way, they might be here. So because there's that potential for miscommunication, I'm inclined to leave it as it is uh, until we get that clarity. Um, though I am uncomfortable with what they submitted, uh, I want to be uh, as fair as possible. So that's where I'm at. Uh, but I'm open. Crystal, what what was the specific question that was asked? Oh, in terms of this response. Yeah. Um, sorry, I need to look at my our email templates. Uh, one moment. It was more so, um, but I, I think I'll, I'll just, while I'm searching for this, it was specific questions regarding what impact the decrease would have on um, their service goals um, or the project, if, if any, but uh, I'll look, let me look for the specific verbiage. Um, so should I, can I just read the email? Yeah. Um, okay, great. So um, dear Rita, thank you for submitting Riverside Legal Aid's 2022 partnership grant proposal for the Smallest States Assistance Partnership uh, Project. Please be advised that the Partnership Grants Committee met on May 7 to determine tentative funding recommendations for the 2022 grant year. As you may know, this was the first time the committee utilized a scoring rubric during the application review process, which was outlined in the RFP. Following the committee's review, the project's overall rubric score was 54 points with a tentative funding recommendation of 70,000. For reference, the average score across all projects was 72 points. In addition to your project's total rubric score, the committee took into consideration the number of years funded, prior award amounts, counties served in substantive areas. The committee called, also kept within a funding range of 25,000 to 120 across the submitted project proposals. Provided this tentative funding amount, how would this impact your proposed project? Would any updates need to be made on your application, in particular services provided and or full numbers? Um, and then we had said no applications are needed at this time since the committee will be taking an additional del deliberations before making final recommendations at its June 18 meeting. Um, we asked for a response on May 25, and, and this email was um, sent on, uh, I think, the week prior. So, so the update they provided was, thanks for the money, we won't be able to do anything. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how I read their, you know, their response. Yeah. I, mean, I think I'm it sorry. was an I effort to, to make a joke of it. It was an effort to, to, to really beg for more, I think, and it backfired. And it, it you know, the email reading it now said we're making final funding recommendations today. So we did give notice. I mean, I, I appreciate what Will said, but I, I do think that in light of Bonnie's comment, if we got back to them and said, look, you know, um, your response more or less indicated to us that with the tentative funding recommendation, you just weren't going to be able to provide anything near what the expectation was. But we anticipate a high likelihood of, of additional partnership grant funding um, that will be available for the 2022 cycle. We can't guarantee it, but there's a high likelihood. And, um, and if that happens, you'll have another chance to submit an application and we'll be happy to consider it. But in the meantime, we just don't think we can, we don't think it's appropriate to fund you. So if that happens and the uh, organization essentially dismantles this project, um, do we have to worry about the, um, potential difficulty of, of rebuilding the project um, after having let go of the staff and um, uh, and and potentially basically shutting down the project and then with the expectation that in the future it, it might have to rebuild the project Oh, 
Well, would they necessarily have to shut down if the money, the later money comes through? Because they'll get that in time, right? Theoretically, yes. And they're, so, they're, they are being funded this year, right? Yes. Yep. Can I just get a uh, clarification uh, in the conversations with them? Was there any indication that we might, that this response might result in no funding or that it was possible that we would strongly consider changing the recommendation? I mean, and we didn't want to speak on behalf of the committee. I, I didn't, I guess I, I didn't foresee that this would be a possibility. We were just, because of the response and um, uh, in, in terms of how much of an impact it would have, the follow-up the follow call was merely for additional clarification or additional information, um, which we weren't necessarily provided um, during that conversation. Uh, but the the um, applicants were all aware that their comments would be provided um, to to the to to you all um, for for consideration. Thanks. I'm also leaning toward redeploying the money, especially due to the likelihood that they'll have another shock. I guess we have to be prepared. I'm, I, I don't, I, I don't, I would stick with my recommendation, but just to be, you know, sort of fully aware of the consequences, I guess if we cut off all funding, there is a possibility that, that we're, that we're going to get complaints to the bar and we're going to have a political issue. So I think we have to be aware of that possibility. I mean, that wouldn't discourage me from doing the right thing, but I just think that's a possibility. Yeah, I'll just say the other side of my question was if money is not going to be as tight, whether, you know, that impacts the decision for now. So, I mean, you could look at it either way, right? That either they could be coming in or other programs. I mean, presumably, I think other programs will want to come back and if there is money and say, oh, I'd love to expand my program in this way. And I think they would need to, I mean, I don't, we haven't discussed the process, but I, I would anticipate that some of our existing programs would also want additional funding. But at any rate, I just, I didn't mean to suggest one way or the other. I just meant to raise it as a question in terms of um, thinking about that, uh, that we may not be dealing as, with as much of a fixed sum as we normally do. So these recommendations go to the commission and the commission as a whole ultimately sends them up. Isn't that how it works? Mm -hmm. So maybe we just- Recommendations go to the judicial council. Yes, and our next meeting is- July. Oh, why do I have a June 25th on my calendar? Is that not- Oh, I'm right? sorry, the, the next commission meeting is yes. June 25th. So maybe we can- discuss this particular one with the whole commission. Would this committee have a recommendation? It's I'm just saying that because it looks like we're split. I think that the the optics issue, if you want to call it that, is a it is something to be considered. Um, I, I'm not sure if the commission has ever um, had an initial recommendation of, of, of a, a certain amount and then gotten a response from the program uh, and then decided to, to withhold any money at all. I'm actually unclear. I think the consensus is to redistribute. Um, so I'm not a part of that consensus. If we are going to do it, I, I guess figuring out what the details of that are uh, and what that recommendation looked like would probably be the best next step. Am I correct? In terms of getting the numbers, 
Um, today, yeah. Okay. This will, this will be shared with the com commission next week. So I'm, I've carried over just the ones that um, match their grant amount because we were not, I don't believe the committee wants to exceed those amounts. Um, and then this is sorted by the rubric scores. Um, did the committee want to see any other data points um, as you relook at the numbers? Seventy was the average. Was kind of the meet expectations score. Is that yes. right? Yeah, around seventy-two was the average. So we have um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We have ten projects above seventy where we've we've cut, right? To some yes. extent. Can I just confirm? Maybe I can copy these numbers over the ones sixty-nine and below keeping with the exception of Riverside, keeping those same amounts because we wouldn't necessarily want this committee to want to keep those funding as recommended. Mm -hmm. um, any good voluntary lawyer program? Uh, yeah, there's there's several now. I'm sorry, let me just do a quick There, let me just ask one more question. Is there a way in terms of making this conditional, maybe this isn't practical, I don't know, but is there a way to get back to Riverside and say, look, um, we'll, we'll give you the 70, but we really need you to risk to fund, to use part of that money to fund a paralegal. I mean, your response that you're not going to do any paperwork is unacceptable. You know, can you, can you give us some assurance that you're going to be at least funding to some extent a paralegal you're going to be able to do some paperwork and making make the funding conditional on that somehow? Is that just not workable? I, I don't know if we can ask, you know, um, ask them to make personnel decisions, um, but I think we can ask them to tell us what they're, be more specific about what their deliverables are. So, um, you know, I, I, I didn't personally review this application, so I don't know exactly what they were proposing. Um, and uh, I think maybe staff, we can go back and ask them what the reduction in funding would mean to their deliverables. Isn't that what we already asked them? Well, they and well, and they and then they said we're going to cut. I mean, hiring a paralegal isn't necessarily a deliverable. To me, a deliverable is we are going to serve X number of self-represented litigants. Okay. or we're going to have X number of workshops. Um, and I don't think we got that information. Yeah, and it certainly wasn't in the context of losing all their funding. Um, I guess, Elizabeth, my question is, uh, by the June 25 meeting, if I, we can get an update from Riverside by then, I can present it to the, to the commission as a whole. Um, can adjustments be made at, at that meeting if, if needed, um, or we'll just keep them? Um, um, I think it would be difficult. Uh, the commission meeting already has a pretty full agenda. There's some big meaty items for the commission yeah. to discuss as a whole. So I think if, um, if the committee doesn't want to um, uh, make the finalized recommendations today, um, we have now a part, a potent, we have a, we will probably have a July partnership grant meeting. Um, and there will be, I think there's an August commission meeting. August 13. Yeah. So, um, uh, so we can, um, have the commission approve those recommendations then. I think that's the timing still works, um, for getting these recommendations to judicial council by September. So we'll take it off yeah. the June 25 meeting then. We'll take I it off. So. 
And, and I just wanted to confirm with Bonnie, it's September, your September meeting, the Judicial Council September meeting where we would need to have the commission's recommendations. Bonnie? Sorry, you missed it. Oh, time. sorry. Um, uh, I just wanted to confirm that um, the Judicial Council's September meeting is when we need to have the commission's recommendations. Yeah, okay. sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> um, I didn't want to just rely strictly on my memory. So, um, so I think that would be okay. I guess my I think that's an excellent option. Um, and then my question would be, um, we'll probably, I guess, reunite this review team to look at um, Riverside's responses and, and work with them through with NDAN in terms of, you know, answering specific questions on behalf of the committee. In the meantime, would that work? I think, um, Eric, I believe this is one of your uh, doors. And I can't remember the review teams right now. Chris? Chris? No. No. Eric, I forgot who was in your review team. Um, Kim, Kim Bartleson. Okay. Yeah. And me. Okay. Ours was the, was it the coolest one? I can't remember. Crystal, is that right? <laughs> Everyone's cool. Uh -huh. um, yes, just a little inter, you know, inter committee, subcommittee group right over in there. <laughs> Okay, um, and then that July meeting as well, we'll have the updates if there's any additional funding for if the committee would feel more comfortable with all of that information um, before finalizing recommendations. Um, does that work? Um, I think if, if, if committee's open to it, staff can make some preliminary suggestions similar to how we did at the May meeting in terms of if, if there's redistribution according you know the review team's suggestions and we can kind of present some scenarios um, and what what that allocation could look like for uh, you know when we meet in July. So what, what would the message if we do that, what would the message be back to Riverside? I think it's, um, the committee has spent a lot of time discussing their response today and are concerned about whether the services will be provided given that they're not going to have this paralegal and we need to better understand what the deliverables would be. Yep. So, so that we would not make a formal vote today, but we so we're sort of tentatively agreed on on the chart that you've presented with the possible exception of Riverside. And we're just gonna mm -hmm. put a pin on that one. Yeah, and I think we will be, we'll, we, we will say, um, you know, the committee is concerned and um, was considering not funding the project. So we, you know, would like yeah. some additional information and clarity. Okay. So when we yeah. come back in July, I mean, I'm super comfortable with that. We come back in July and now in addition to this one item on hold, We've now got an additional four million to distribute. Um, potentially, potentially. Three million, whatever, whatever it is, <laughs> good. So I guess we'll just sort of have to throw that in the mix. We we we, we might have two million seventy thousand to distribute. You know, if we take the money away from from Riverside. <laughs> okay. I think it'll be it'll be okay. Yeah. Okay. I think it'll be pretty easy based on the response to assess. Yeah what they're going to do. So hopefully that won't take up much more time. All right. I will, I will not put that motion on the screen and we'll um, table it until our um, June or July meeting. Okay. All right. Item 4B, review and receive the 2020 partnership grant evaluation report. And that's Crystal. Yeah, so I'm going to just provide a, just a brief update um, about the 2020 partnership grant evaluation reports received. So um, we received 38 out of the 38 projects um, who um, were funded in, in that grant year, um, and they all submitted on time by the March 12th deadline. Um, just in terms of overall trends, the courthouse closures were statewide during the pandemic, um, and most projects pivoted to providing remote services to litigants. And um, staff will be meeting with Judicial Council this year to 
um, you know, update the valuation component, including, um, you know, developing trainings to grantees, developing uh, resources and, you know, examples for the grantees, and, um, you know, potentially updating the valuation report and instructions. Um, I believe some of the committee members expressed interest in, um, in, in this process. So, you know, we're happy to invite the committee members to participate. I think I see Eric nodding um, enthusiastically uh, <laughs> for this. Is that, is that Eric, is that true? We'll, we'll look you in. Great. Is there anyone? Were available in March that they submitted the 2020 they, in March. They submitted their um, kind of how the 2020 evaluate, um, grant year went on March 12. So it's it's all on Smart Simple, um, you know the, those individual reports. But all everyone submitted there sometime. Hmm. So we had that available when we were reviewing these. I forgot mm -hmm. if I even looked at those. We had yeah, they, they were available during application review time. Okay. And and I do think. Committee members did look at at least some of the working groups that I sat in on. Yeah. The committee members did review them in, in conjunction with the applications. Okay. Okay, so that just was the update for that agenda item. Okay, next is um, the partnership grant scoring rubric debrief. Okay, great. So um, I will share my screen once more. I will update this calendar that these dates here that we see um, with the new July meeting. <clears throat> so um, I believe the committee received um, the uh, link to the survey monkey, which had a list of questions um, regarding the um, 2022 scoring rubric and the updated application review process. Generally, it was 11 questions, and then we had five point Richter scales, you know. Uh, helpful versus like easy to use and things like that. And then we received responses from five committee members as of June 16. So um, what I'm gonna do is kind of go over what that looks like. Um, SurveyMonkey has some nice graphs so we can just see, you know, the committee's general opin opinion regarding the questions. Um, I have some kind of tech takeaways and recommendations and then some discussion questions that I'm just hoping we can get into. But if um, anyone feels strongly about any of these specific like questions or feedback, uh, as I'm going over the results, we can we can pause and talk about them as well. Uh, so the first question, um, Q1 was, um, what was the committee member's name? I don't think we need to know all of that. <laughs> uh, so Q2 was how helpful was the scoring rubric um, in your review process? Um, I believe it's this was three responses for the very helpful and then slightly helpful and not at all helpful had um, one, uh, one vote each. Um, and this was just kind of the overall scoring rubric and, and the approach. Um, that was what this question asked about. Uh, question three, did you find the scoring rubric form easy to use? This was the, the fillable PDF and with the points calculated um, and sections as well. Uh, question four, were the category scores and weights easy to understand? Um, four to one in terms of um, how the committee felt. Uh, question five, um, this was regarding the meet, succeeds, and below expectations definitions, um, as well as the examples provided in the partnership grant review guide. Um, so kind of split in that, and I, I wanted to we'll talk about that a little bit more towards the end. Uh, question six, how helpful were the selection criteria category descriptions when scoring your assigned proposal? Um, that one's a little bit, I think, just hearing informally through the review teams, you know, that definitely looks like something we want to maybe revisit and, um, and refine for um, the next year. Q7, um, how helpful was the funding parity descriptions when scoring the assigned proposals? Similar to the selection criteria, um, I think, um, you know, this kind of hints to room for improvement. Uh, question eight was regarding the optional innovation description um, and how helpful those were. I think majority were at um, somewhat helpful. Uh, question nine, um, how helpful was the calibration process of reviewing and scoring the same proposal? Generally, I think that had more favorable um, responses in terms of ranging from slightly helpful to extremely helpful. Question 10, um, how helpful were the subsequent calibration sessions? Um, 
of reviewing the same set proposals assigned to the review team. Um, similarly, um, slightly helpful to extremely helpful. Uh, question 11, how helpful was staff's proposed approach to develop tenant offending recommendations? Um, that one, I think a lot, uh, a lot of you found that very helpful, which is, is nice. <laughs> um, and these are just additional comments, um, just specifically that verbatim that I pulled from, from the, uh, from SurveyMonkey, uh, just for, for reference. Uh, so I think notes about project impact, um, and then I think the services rendered and projects applied that kind of deals with that evaluation component, uh, which, which we'll, we will be working on. Um, so in terms of the takeaways and recommendations based on the responses received, it um, appears that the calibration sessions and the staff funding recommendations were helpful in the review process. Uh, we did uh, indicate and, and do recognize the need for you know, more meaningful evaluations. Um, and I think one of our general recommendations was to include um, excerpts from the 2022 proposals um, as examples for the future RFPs. So uh, we'll look at the 2022 stack and see what responses and or what projects had a meets or an exceeds um, or what kinds of projects were awarded innovation points now that we've actually gone through that process and we'll be able to provide that in the RFP. Um, let's see. So these were the discussion questions. Um, I'll start with the partnership grant review guide, but once we get to the scoring rubric, I can pull up the actual, the physical scoring rubric to see if there were any comments you wanted to leave for now while it's still, the process still fresh and fresh-ish in people's brains, um, and we can um, kind of revisit it if needed. So the first question I wanted to ask the committee is, um, what changes to the partnership grant review guide uh, would, would help or be more helpful with, with proposal review? Um, so the guide was something that was sent, I think, before the um, applications were submitted. It had an overview of the process, um, the deadlines, um, examples uh, from the test drive in terms of what was rated as exceeds meets or below. So if, um, did the committee have any specific comments regarding the, the actual guide document? Um, again, you know, I've only said this about too many times. Sorry, people are getting sick of this, but I, I still think we need more guidance on um, to the projects on how they're measuring potential impact, you know, services rendered, how many people are you going to serve? What kinds of service do you anticipate serving? What kinds of services? I, I just find it so difficult to, to tease that information out of the application, even though there's that chart that we have, but um, I just have trouble reading that. You just asked me for any one of these projects, how many people are you going to serve? I, I don't know that I could really give a good answer based on that chart. Okay. So it doesn't seem like there were, oh, go ahead. I didn't want to cut anyone off. That's right. That's my, that's my thing. I was just going to say, yeah, clarifying definitions for me uh, throughout, I think there could be, um, and I, I can pull up specifics at, at a later time. Yeah, let's let's actually do that now. I didn't seem think there were any. It didn't look like there were any specific uh, feedback regarding the the guide. So let me pull up the scoring rubric and we can take a look at it all together. And I had, and, uh, forgive me, I forgot the questions already. One broader idea that I, I wanted to pitch was. Should there be a different rubric for new projects versus continuing projects? Where now we have the ability to evaluate to, or to look at their evaluations and our own evaluations of their ongoing efforts uh, versus a new project where it's, it is all about the plan. Do we think this plan is viable, effective, will have impact? Um, and it's something as I was doing comments uh, for myself, I was like, you know, I. I wonder if we should just split them and if that might be helpful in, in clarifying um, ongoing projects, their evaluation, what we'll be looking at based on what they've said they're going to do and what we consider impactful versus a project that, that doesn't have a track record yet. Um, and we don't have to discuss that now. 
I didn't want to throw it out there. Hmm. I'm still waiting for my Word, Microsoft Word to load. Um, <laughs> So overall, I think the intent of kind of the debrief is, you know, what to, to what we want to do is, you know, talk about the experiences and or like what could we do to, to better refine the rubric, for example, if, if I were to get copied and pasted into the 2023 grant year, like what are some things that the committee would would like to change, you know, knowing that we do have some limitations regarding um, some of policies or that, you know, codification um, is, would also be a factor. So let me share my screen. Well, did you mean the definitions for the exceeds meets and um, and below? I, think I was able to 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 eventually get on board with those. It was actually on the the categories and the um, where they where you talked about those definitions where I started. To... Yeah, and it, it could be that what would be most helpful is to simply divide these up. Um, so there were instances where. The court involvement seemed very, very strong, um, but integration with other court-based services seemed non-existent. And and then trying to balance, is it it exceeds? Then where where do I divide this, and how do I score for court involvement when portions of it seem like they don't meet the expectation? Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. So what would you, yeah. Or, or I guess if you can clarify, would that be mean like sectioning off court involvement or having a different weight to it? Or what, I guess, what would that look like in terms of the rubric? Uh, yeah. I, the simplest method to me seemed like sectioning off certain subcategories. Um, so it was clear. And I think it was, uh, uh, if you go down a little bit further here, like the administration. Uh, where they seem to have adequate staffing and leadership that look, it would look great. And then, but as far as outreach and resource development um, it was so different than staffing. And yet I had to try and, and, and combine those scores. And I think it would have been easier instead of conflating the two to just have a, a subcategory and be able to score those pieces I'm just trying to take notes while we're talking. Sure, sure. And especially where um, I remember Justice Murray talking about how great one particular program's um, outreach or what I might call marketing. Um, and they had, it was, it was amazing. It was exceptional, um, but their, their staffing and leadership was just average. Um, and being able to account for that so that one, it provides better transparency to the programs. And two, I think the scoring uh, could be a little more refined there. Uh, and I think there are a couple of categories where it's combined in a way where I'm like, oh, I, I wish I could split that out and give them meets for this. And, and I'm not sure how that uh, plays out in terms of the scoring overall, but I think it would definitely help to have a discrete sections where it's like this is the thing that I am scoring and then I don't have to combine two different things into a single score would be helpful to me. Um, would it be helpful I guess as a such proposal um, instead of having it be like three points three points three points it would be you know these would be split into different sections and then it'll be the exceeds meets and below check marks and it'd be something you could potentially check mark across uh, for the sub for the subsection or that subcategory. The staffing would have kind of a separate um, row, and then you would meet like you would check exceeds meets or below, but it would still be in the administration bucket uh, with an overall score of um, you know ten six or three. Would that help? Would that help guide kind of the how you're checking 
the different nuances in each category. Off the top of my head without considering it, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> um, I, I would want to like think it through, but yeah, that, that definitely sounds like a way of addressing that concern where it was like, oh, don't, I don't know how to split these. I don't know how to come up with the, the, the best score. And so it'd be a wobbler for me, like, well, on this portion, they really meet expectation, but on this portion, I'm like, it, it's not meeting the expectation at all. But I, as I interpret the, please chime, chime in. <laughs> well, no, I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with separating it out, but I, I do, I mean, that may make sense. I mean, it would be a little more work, but for us, but that, that, that if that's helpful to you, it's okay with me. But I just have a problem with distinguishing these projects, like a proposal will have adequate staffing and leadership. I mean, they all kind of seemed, and maybe, maybe if we go up to the exceeds meets on this category to see if it helps us, but, you know, high quality addressing all questions, et cetera. I mean, a lot of these projects, they're, they're very similar in terms of their structure. You know, they had like, you know, a managing attorney and they had a staff attorney and maybe they had a paralegal and they said that the, you know, the, the, the on-duty attorney would review all the paperwork. I mean, they all seem very similar in that regard or many of them seem very similar. So it's hard for me to, to distinguish and exceeds from a meets in that category. And in the other category as well, like even going back to the court relationship with the court, um, the first set of things we looked at, um, if you could kind of scroll, either scroll up or scroll down, I'm not sure where you are. Oh yeah, court involvement, significant cooperation between the court. Um, you know, a lot of them said, we're gonna meet quarterly. We talk every day, our staff talks every day to the relevant staff person at the court. Um, it, we tended to kind of rate most of these as meets in that in that area, and maybe that's maybe that's right. I don't know, but I mean, is there a, is there a more specific way that we could identify a project that exceeds expectations in terms of cooperation with the court? What would that even look like? I think for some that were um, that had exceeds expectation, I think, for example, the um, calibration application we looked at. Uh, for LACPA. I think they met with the court almost daily, and then there was some integration of the IT systems as well. Um, that seemed more so than having um, the organization staff like at the courthouse. Like there was a, a, love, a little level more of, um, of, of an integration on that level. Yeah, there. Well, maybe, maybe, we, could, maybe we could add some of those examples into okay. the guide. I, I have one that I reviewed and I noted and they got exceeds there and it, I, I had put the court appears to be very supportive of the project and apparently has expressed interest in absorbing most of the project costs beyond the funding period. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was exceeds. Mm -hmm. The court's going to pay for it. Hmm. Um, so now that we have the 2022 proposals and the examples, I wouldn't necessarily want to put those examples in the rubric just to kind of make it cleaner, but we can include it in the RFP like below if, if the organizations want additional details as to what would be an exceeds, um, I don't know if you want a below expectations response, but what an exceeds or a meets would look like um, as examples. It, it would lengthen the RFP, but then it would be a little bit more comprehensive because now we have actual examples. Um, can I ask a question? So I'm not gonna uh, belabor my distaste for this, um, but I guess I, this is a math question, which is, um, you know, and I'm certainly no math expert, but it seems to me like if there is a math expert in this group or at the bar, we should ask this question to them, which is, you know, these distinctions are meaningful to the extent that they actually demonstrate differences. and. I would think that as a matter of just math, that you know there would ultimately be a meaningful range that is statistically significant between one program in one category versus one program in another category. And as I understand it, you know those are basically 
described by standard deviations. So on a bell curve, you get you know a clump in the middle and then you get excellence on the long tail and you get you know trash on the on the long tail of the bad side. And it just I guess I'm wondering whether the data that we collected here in this in this process the first time around, demonstrated a bell curve and whether that bell curve actually uh, pushes any programs, you know, a standard deviation outside of the, the, the I don't know if it's the median or the mean, I think it's probably the mean um, in any of the categories. Because I guess, you know, ultimately it feels like the goal here is to like make funding decisions and to communicate to programs this is a great application or this is a great program and while that might be a meaningful goal um you know telling somebody you got a 3.15 and they got a 3.09 is totally a meaningless metric unless those two numbers actually represent some departure from the meaning, you know, from, from the mean. Like, I'm reminded of like, well, <laughs> anyway. So is there math being done here? Because I, I just feel like, you know, the, the proverbial hair splitting doesn't really help somebody a program filling out an application if you know well you, you know you got a 72 and they got a 73 and no one can say why 73 happened versus 72 and no yeah. one can also explain why the difference of one point actually matters yeah other than other than you know ultimately the funding <laughs> well i i do think um chris Crystal did put in her analysis when um, when the committee was looking at the funding amounts last meeting that um, I think it was 70 was the mark where um, uh, app applicants received either all um, you know meets across the board or meets or a combination of meets and exceeds and then it, below 70 they had categories that were below expectations so I feel like not as precise as a standard deviation Christian but um, it, it's it was at least um, some marker uh, to, to communicate with with grant uh, applicants about you know where they were compared to um, others. Right, but isn't that an artificial distinction or at least arbitrary in the sense that had we had fifty million dollars, we would have funded everybody, and so that number doesn't really have any meaning. It's just relative to our funding amount. Well, I mean. I would ask the committee, you know, if we had fifty million dollars, if there was a really poor proposal, would you still want to fund it? Uh, that is the right question to ask. <laughs> I, I very much appreciate that you have flagged that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the answer is no, because I think our job is to not waste money. Mm -hmm. So a bad proposal, when you're flush, should get axed. In, this is my, my opinion, maybe others have different opinions, but like our job isn't to just throw money at programs that aren't worthy, our program, our, uh, you know, that money should be spent on worthy programs mm -hmm. and we sh because it creates incentives that are wrong. And, and I guess, yeah, I, again, I, 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 I wanna just make sure that these like these numbers have meaning mm -hmm. and it seems to me like i have not heard why they have meaning between 69 and 70 and 71 like i i don't know how to message that to a program and yeah. i and, and i also don't know why it matters like yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, your point's well taken. I think we can probably refine how what what these numbers mean so that they are meaningful, so that uh, applicants understand how 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 that it's being used um, in the funding decisions. Chris, um, 
you're talking about the final score or you're talking about the, the scores, the individual scores for each of these categories? Well, I guess, you know, they're related because the final scores are a, a cumulative individual categorical sum. So, right, right. I mean, so, you know, I, I, I will bore the committee here with the example that I was in my head is that when you coach Little League, at some level, they do a draft. And all these dads and other coaches and moms to some, you know, some much smaller amount go to the tryouts and they grade these kids. And everybody suddenly believes they're like the general manager in the major leagues. It's an absurdity. And what happens is they get these kids to go through various stations, run, hit, throw, et cetera. And they grade them on a scale of one to five. And then you go to the draft and you have the, you hear these inane conversations. Well, I have, you know, old Johnny at 3.61 on average. And somebody else said, well, I've got him at 3.63. I mean, it's so dumb. And then, you know, then they draft these kids based on these absolutely meaningless distinctions between whether the kid threw the ball to first, you know, hard enough. I mean, it's, it's just, I would not know what to tell a kid how to improve his score any more than I can tell a program right now how to improve their score about court involvement. So, it, you know, this is just like, I get our goal here, transparency, but I confess, um, and I'm, and again, I know how much work staff is doing. So I just feel terrible belaboring this, but I really am a, an unwilling passenger on this train. I think this process is really a lot of effort for no reason that I can discern. I, mean, I will say though, Chris, like for the organizations who received Lesson 70, um, you know, during the review, like the calibration process, like I did communicate, like I, I know that um, us in staff, we did communicate, like if, if a program fell below exceeds expectations and the, uh, below, oh, sorry, if they fell below expectations for a specific category, that was communicated with them, knowing that that, that ultimately impacted their scores. Um, I mean, I just graphed what the scores were and it's a linear, so it's not necessarily a bell curve in terms of what the score looks like. Um, you know, with majority of the scores being 70 and up, I don't know, maybe it would be clearer in the RFP to just indicate that in terms of what the spread looked like for, you know, the prior grant for 2022. Um, I think in, in terms of math, uh, you know, what we, what staff did recommend was kind of incremental decreases and increments of five utilizing 70 points as kind of the, the base factor. So if a committee, if an organization scored 69 and they saw that they were below 70 points, seeing the 5% the decrease, they would know why they received a reduction in, in grand amounts. So, I mean, I think we do have math behind it. Um, Except yeah. Crystal, Except, Crystal, that is itself an act of, of subjectivity. I mean, this is the whole thing, is that, like, why a program gets marked down, to me, is still just as mysterious, and it's still a function of a subjective determination about what is below expectations. I mean, I guess, like, I want to say something positive about the staff. You guys clearly have this holistic view, and I that is to me the essential element of this review process is you have seen all of these things you have institutional knowledge and experience as well as uh, a line of sight into critical elements of how these programs are operating the courts in which they're operating and the programs the, the operational sort of execution of the of the program itself those are the critical elements of these of these grant analyses. I mean, to me, the question, like, I think like the way you would do this in a truly mathematical way is you would say, it, are our funding decisions better than random? And I would say, well, they are, but they have, it really has nothing to do with the scoring. 
I mean, I would say we need to be gatekeepers for qualification. Are people meeting qualifications? Are they meeting qualifications? Once they are through that gate, then the question is, is our funding decision better than random? I have no question that the committee and the staff has the, you know, the ability to decide, look, this is a problem. We got to flag this, they got to fix this. But once they're through the gate of qualification, we're making subjective determinations. Well, we, we, we are, but we are making subjective determinations, but do you, I mean, do you think we're, we're in totally incapable of saying uh, as to a project or projects that, yeah, you guys exceed expectations in one or more dimensions. That, that's what a score above 70 means, that somebody has, that a group has decided that this project exceeds expectations in one or more dimensions. And yeah, there's, there is subjectivity involved, but it's not random. There is a basis for it that we could, we could justify. I, I totally agree. There is a basis, but the idea that this number attaches to it is like, it's a fake metric. It, it is just a reflection of our subjective determination of what exceeds is versus what meets. I mean, this is like, this is the thing is all this effort goes in to attach these numbers. Ultimately, the programs are going to react to the numbers, right? Like, does this meet, exceed, or fall below? And, you know, like, I don't know. Can you tell, like, Christina gave an example of how somebody exceeded, uh, you know, court involvement. Mm -hmm. What control does a program have over a court's interest in taking over, you know, the funding or the program itself? Almost none. But what will happen is that that program will then focus their efforts on delivering services that the court is interested in, in that way to take over funding. And, you know, that's gonna give advantages to certain counties and the programs that serve those counties in ways that I just don't think is a meaningful way to distribute this money. So, all right. Um, that's it for me. I'm, I'm, to I'm a total obstacle here. I get it. The consensus is really elsewhere. And that's, yeah, I get it. This reminds me of our performance review process that we did at our company, you know, where um, you, you had, you know, you gave some people a higher bonus because they quote exceeded expectations in some way. And you had to kind of justify it. It's the same conversation there. Well, what do you mean exceeded expectations? You just kind of but you have to try. I mean, it's not perfect, but I think you have to well, try to distinguish these programs. Well, I, I mean, I, I wanna throw in my lot with Christian. I, I also struggled with the, um, the rubric scoring. I, I, I had a hard time with it. Um, and I, I think um, for a lot of the same reasons that, that Christian did, um, the other, the other reason is that uh, I think as we got going with our 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 group, our subgroup, um, we at least I realized that that my idea of what meets or exceeds expectations uh, didn't have a whole lot of similarity to anybody else's. Um, so we had to get some feedback about about that, uh, and I'm still not sure what exactly that meant. And so it, it did seem like we were running the risk that the, the score, and, and I'm, I'm sorry, I had to back, uh, leave for a second, but I'm back now. Um, so I don't know if this was already mentioned, but it did seem that there was a risk that uh, an organization's score was going to depend on which uh, two-person evaluation group it was assigned to. And I and I I guess the um, the, the um, way that that was addressed was having the staff do its own evaluation and then have the uh, the two person group 
um, speak with with staff and see if those those um, scores could be sort of um, made consistent with the staff's scoring. Um, but I, I mean, I suppose if we were going to be uh, entirely um, I don't know what the word is consistent. Maybe I, I guess everybody on the committee would score all of the applications, and then we'd um, get the uh, average score. Um, but um, that would certainly be a lot of work. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up, Judge Eskel. And you know, calibration was something that we were aware of. I think even with grading the bar exam, there are variances in terms of approach and easy versus hard graders. So that's why there's usually a consultant or someone to be the common thread. So I think the calibration process was, was helpful. I, I believe I said in, in all, if not most of, of the sessions to kind of share the feedback in terms of how other review teams were approaching certain categories or what the conversations have been so far to provide some additional information. And I think that process will be very similar moving forward um, because we do recognize that reviewing 38 applications um, well, to, for each in the, for an individual would, is a, is a lot of is a lot of um, energy um, and um, commitment uh, more so than we'd we'd want to ask the the committee um, the committee to okay to kind of take so. I have a yeah. question. If I, um, Chris, I really felt that example in my soul there. Um, and I wanted to respond specifically to your question. In, in my view. You know, the difference between a 69 and a 71 is, is nothing. Statistically, it's just nothing. Um, there is no difference. Where I hope for value and why I was not a fan of the rubric to begin with, as everyone recalls, my hope is that we can move away from subjective to meet the goal, as you put it, money should be spent on worthy programs. And my question to you would be, is there any way that this rubric can, or something similar, can get us to that point where we are achieving that goal, spending the money on worthy programs and giving them, even if it's some portions of it are still subjective, giving them actionable responses where they can improve either their proposals or their programs? Is it possible? For, for like organizations to improve their scores? No, no, I know it's possible for them to improve their scores, but just yeah. conceptually, big picture, um, to understand where Chris is at, I, I'm what, curious whether. What problem are we solving for? I mean, this, my, is, this is the- My this, understanding is- <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead, Well, I, I mean- I, I guess my, my understanding is we're, we're solving for transparency and consistency. And so right now we don't have that, in my opinion. The rubrics definitions and categorization is conflates a lot of things so that the clarity isn't there. Um, and especially on evaluations, in my opinion, we're not improving clarity, but I have to believe that that's where we're headed. Otherwise, why am I sitting here trying to improve it? <laughs> Well, I guess the way I look at it is like this. The Board of Trustees, in response to unrelated concerns or concerns unrelated to the commission and the commission's work, undertook an effort to improve, to use your words, transparency and consistency in other areas of the, of the uh, bar's work. And we got swept up in it. As far as I know, in terms of the relative dollar amounts that we have overseen as a commission with staff and in the history of the program, there has been something approaching no complaint. I mean, we've had minor issues over the years. I've been involved for many years at this stage but there are people with longer term memories than me. And I think they could, would support much of what I'm saying, if not all, but the problem didn't really exist. Programs weren't clamoring for more, you know, transparency and consistency, because I think 
what was being communicated out through our very hardworking staff left everybody feeling okay. So I just think that this solves for a problem that doesn't exist, never existed, was a click was solving what we got dragged in for the bars, other transparency issues. And we simply are now sort of, we're the sort of square peg <laughs> being asked to fit into the bars round hole. That's my, that's my take. I just didn't think there was an inconsistency that anybody was really complaining about. Um, and I didn't think and I think the idea of objectivity here is um, charitably fallacious. It's not objective. We, I mean, from the perspective of a program, if I'm sitting there trying to write a grant, like, I, you don't think I can improve that or I can improve the program I, through feedback from the... If, if, I, if I may oh, sorry, respond go. to Christian, um, uh, Christian, I respectfully disagree. I was an applicant for 13 years for partnership grant as a, in a legal aid organization. And um, it was very unclear what the expectations were. I mean, we had, you know, the RFPs, but we, as an applicant, we did not necessarily know like what the committee would prioritize or what the committee favored in making their funding decisions. It was kind of, unknown and you know it was uh, you know you could guess but it was never very clear because it did change from year to year or by who was on the committee um evaluating your application and so well, i do think i do think that having a rubric provided did provide some clarity to to the applicants so that they could at least say like oh, okay this is how it might be weighted um and and i do think um you know, and I didn't review all the applications this year, but I do think the quality of some of the applications did improve with, with this tool for them. And, we got, and we got we've it. always said that this RFP is just a tool. These are discretionary grants, so there is subjectivity in how you're evaluating them. Um, but it, it's just another kind of information point, data point for you to use. Have we gotten feedback on the rubric from, uh, from the community? That will be the, the next step, but um, you know, I think the, the absence of um, comments regarding the, the rubric scores, I don't know like what that says, but we do want to send us a, a very similar survey, well, not a similar survey, but a survey out to, to the grantees after um, you know, allocations are decided, probably will be after July then with, with that in mind. I, I just want to say, Elizabeth, I find your comments to be really meaningful. And I really appreciate them. And I, and I am open to them. Um, and so I will stand down if the will of the community is gung ho for this, because I will be I will respond to that evidence. I really will. Okay. Um, yeah. And I, I do think it'll be useful when we do survey applicants on what they're how they what their feedback is with the rubric. Um, I, and I know that um, uh, grantees are very used to rubrics because other foundations use them, LSC uses them. Um, and so it, I, it, I think it is helpful, it is guidance. Um, so that, um, yeah, we'll, we, we'll definitely provide you additional information um, moving forward on that. Well, I would just say thank you for that. And I would, for making those comments as a former applicant, but I, I will say, as you probably know, mm -hmm. we haven't heard that. That has it's, not it's been- bit, It's very hard for a, grant, uh, a grantee to give feedback to their funder yeah, we're in that way. Yeah, we're in a serious position of power over them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're, they're not gonna mm -hmm. jump on board to criticize, well, you guys could be doing it better. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Um. I, say, I guess in going back to the rubric, I think this is something we're going to like revisit throughout the year too, but I wanted to capture any other specific concern, or I guess not concerns, but things you wanted to note to, to potentially revisit. So I, I have little suggestions, um, potential, and then Chris's as well as, you know, 
maybe incorporating some statistical or data points um, for reference in the RFP? Were there any kind of more general feedback um, that maybe to include um, or update in the scoring rubric? I think my, my specific question was regarding evaluation. Um, you know, this, this will be something we're, we're gonna be developing and, and improving. Um, currently it's scored at 10 points. I, I just wanted to check in if that, um, if, if, there, if the committee wanted to consider more weight to this section um, or keep it as is, and we'll just have more clear, hopefully more clarity once we get um, revisions or updates to that component. I, I don't know how to answer that <laughs> because the philosophically, I'm, I'm not sure we're capturing as much in the rubric of the actual evaluation versus the plan for evaluation. Hmm. Um, for me, it's really, that's, that's key. You know, uh, did they do the things they said they were gonna do? And is it having the impact as much as it can be measured that we, we said, but what they, what they said, what th they're gonna do, that really feels like it's a, and whether they achieve that or whether they had to adapt, um, because that's completely reasonable. You know, you go in with the game plan and then the rubber hits the road and you're like, we got to change. We want to do this, we want to do that. Um, I think that's, know. The, that's the project impact piece of it in the first part of the survey. And again, that gets back to me, it gets back to a comment that I keep on making, you know, how many people are you going to serve? What kinds of services are you doing? And did you do it? Yeah. Absolutely. I completely echo that. And how do we capture that versus the proposed versus because it's as it's phrased, it's all about the proposed, not retrospectively, have you done it? What actually happened? As at least as I read it. This, this potentially could be um, kind of if, if we do, if the committee wants to do that sub approach, it would be like what was planned and what did the prior years or the prior evaluation reflect? Um, that's I think that's within kind of the review parameters. Um, I, I, can I just say, I, if as a person that wrote grant proposals, it would certainly encourage me to get my evaluation done and to be thoughtful about what I said if I was clear that the committee was going to review and consider it as part of the, their rubric. So I think if, if, if the committee is considering that, I think being explicit that they're looking at that evaluation, I think seems fair and helpful to me like like yeah like just to follow up on that one like in the application where we have this chart forecasting what they're going to do this year could we actually ask the question how does this compare for, for those projects mm -hmm. that are not new how does this compare to last year and you know did you meet your objectives last year something like that something very specific in the application for them to respond to do we get the we get the applicant we get the evaluations in March? Yeah, apparently. March 12th, yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, you could, I mean, it could theoretically, right? The the um, evaluations should stay that. Um, but that's an interesting point because then it also gives people, well, anyway, it could either be in the evaluation or it could be in the in the grant proposal itself. And then the question is, how do you deal with that for new programs, which goes to William's yes, earlier yeah, point. Right. It would actually be easier on the reviewer if it were in the application or the grant itself. So then you would have to flip back and forth between a lot of different documents. There were some, I mean, there's some data points in the evaluation that like the organization wouldn't necessarily well, there's like project budget and kind of the expense spent funds and some other pieces that I think might warrant it being a separate report. But if they yeah, yeah, yeah. If there's some places to highlight that maybe they can just reiterate or copy and paste onto, yeah. I think that's some that's yeah. something to potentially do. But Crystal, on eligibility, the first part of the application, the rubric, can we assume the staff is gonna is gonna vet that? Because you you had the reviewers filling that out, but I I thought the staff was gonna was gonna vet no, that. Those should have been filled by the um, the staff assigned to the review team, um, and then the review guide also said that staff was going to look at it. We just didn't put it here 
because this is the RFP and it's that's more of an administrative thing. But staff did confirm eligibility before um, for all of the projects before before moving them before discussing them with the review teams. So when the reviewers were filling these out, we could have ignored that section. Yeah. You, it should have been pre-filled. I'm, I'm sorry it wasn't, but it should have been pre-filled by the time you received it. <laughs> Man, you got the short shift. It was pre-filled for me. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> um, and then for the optional innovation, now that we've granted points, um, we'll just probably um, add those examples in here with the 2022, um, just some of the examples. Um, um, uh, Okay. Oh, oh I, I had additional feedback, but I think it could really be just done, Crystal, directly to you on some more uh, splits in, in the categories, or at least maybe the, the phrasing, uh, if, if you have time at some point. Oh, it's to, to talk about what they could look like, or? Yeah, just to not take up time here. And then the other, uh, if you have time. Well, I guess I'll see. Uh, the other thing was the making sure that the partnership grant application instructions match match. I guess what we actually evaluate. So the the two examples, the two uh, small examples. But um, if we tell the applicants that the technology hardware exp expenses need to be less than a thousand, or their equipment purchases need to be under a thousand, or that they can't use this money to pay for any court space or uh, the funds won't be used for that, then just making sure that that actually gets checked off somewhere or is part of the process. I'm not sure how it fits in the rubric. Maybe it doesn't need to. It just needs to be feedback directly to the applicant. But I noticed in some of my grants, it, it seemed like they went over those, but there was no check on those instructions. And, having that clarity for the applicants and for us would be excellent. It would be more like tips of, you know, I don't even know if it would be in the applicant, it would be in the instructions, I think, as you mentioned, and be more of like a, a tip um, or, or um, a guide to note. Is that what you mean? Like notes, like in terms of court space is generally just, just donated or? If, if it's, if it's going to be in the instructions, we should be checking it. You know, if we are setting that expectation because Okay. Otherwise, it's not. Uh, we're not following through. That was a, a problem I had as a having to help on grant request is I follow the instructions. <laughs> I guess similarly, um, you know, the application in general, um, if there were any other feedback, initial feedback at this point after looking at them, I will say I feel like the, the proposal qualities, it just felt a little bit more cleaner in terms of following along with the rubric and that was intentional with those revisions. Is there anything else that would be um, helpful in the application review process or in the application itself um, during for your reviews or it was it was okay. I'm trying to remember what got copy pasted in the applications I read. Uh, it feels like we're moving in the right direction and, and the application consolidation. Uh, and if that continued, I think we would get closer. Great. Um, and then just the two other questions I had from, from our debrief question was, um, what changes, if any, should be made to the proposal review, review process and kind of a summary, that's the initial calibration that everyone looked at the same app. Then we met, um, I think two or three times with our respective review teams to discuss it and then bring it back to the larger group. Is the committee in favor, maybe moving that, just similarly doing that again for, for next year? Any concerns about that? <laughs> I thought it was a pretty good process, actually. Um, I, were, were you expecting the review teams, in addition to scoring the projects, to actually come up with a funding recommendation? Because no. it seems like 
staff did most of the laboring more on that. No, and that was my next question, whether like that was, I think it was, it would have been too premature. We have historically asked for funding recommendations, but I think it's helpful to take a look at the full scope. And because staff had all of those data points, uh, I guess the question is, would it would that be something you want to move forward to the next year where we'd have a kind of a staff recommendation and then the committee can kind of sort through it like we did this year in terms of counties funded, substantive areas, et cetera. I feel I felt like that expedited. Um, that was that good. Was, okay. I thought that was great because that's usually like a six hour meeting <laughs> to go through each one. That was awesome. I, I thought it was good too and very helpful, but it would be good to remind us when we do the reviews of, of some of the parameters you came up with this year, just so we can be thinking about it before the meeting. You know, we'll cap things at 120, we'll tier the proposals in the way that you tiered them, et cetera, et cetera, so that you know, maybe we can be thoughtful about that before the meeting when we actually look at the funding recommendations. Yes, I, we can definitely communicate that. I think that was the first time um, that we tried to like make it systematic like that, but if that was something I think worked well, um, we'll, we'll do it again, you know. <laughs> okay. I mean, those were all of the discussion questions I wanted to touch base on just to kind of Com be comprehensively went through this process since April. So two, two months ago, um, I think every, the committee worked very hard to, to get um, us to the point where we're, we're at today. Um, were there any other concerns? Or I think what I want to do uh, is actually do the follow-up with the um, applicants um, before the July meeting. And I, I can share that feedback um, mm -hmm. from them as we kind of make final recommendations. Are there any questions you specifically wanted to ask the applicants in terms of feedback from the rubric or the group or the scoring uh, or the application review process that I can include in kind of the survey form format or you just wanted to get their general feedback on approach or P information, et cetera? Well, I assume you're going to ask you got the summary question as to whether they found it helpful or not. <laughs> yeah. Maybe some phrase around uh, whether it's actionable the, the the feedback or the rubric gives them actions that they can take if that makes sense yeah and i don't want to set up a straw man but in just in in creating in in the questionnaire for the um for the community it would be interesting for me to know if again i, I definitely do not want to lead the witness here and the taint of, of this question, but I guess I'd be interested to know, like, would it be, like, would it be preferable to just um, qualify, like to, to get, to do what it takes to qualify and then to have funding decisions sort of come out of that so that the communication from staff and the committee is like, you've been deemed to qualify. So it would, it would create sort of an opacity. But so anyway, I, I don't have a great way to do that, but. By qualified, do you mean meeting the eligibility requirements? Yeah, for, but specifically for a partnership grant, meaning like you've checked off the boxes for court involvement, you've checked off the boxes for having an eligible program, you've checked off the boxes for, you know, and then it's, you know, and then, Then it's like, you know, you're in the mix. I, I think my thought is, you know, all of the projects here um, that we're looking at all met eligibility requirements. Um, and then we had a prior discussion about Riverside Legal Aid and potentially redistributing um, their money. So I don't know if that would communicate something Helpful. differently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so. Okay. But, but maybe kind of along those lines, uh, is there something we should be evaluating or that we missed, or I'm not sure how we want the best way to phrase that, but. Like a, uh, something, another aspect of the project that maybe wasn't in the application or that okay. for special like additional consideration. Yeah, great. Okay, I'll be in touch with, I'll be in touch with you um, applicants then, but I believe. Yeah, that was the, the debrief. Thank you so much for everyone for your feedback. 
interesting change. I think it was overall very positive, I think, um, this year. Are there any other um, items that anybody would like to discuss before we adjourn? Uh, I, I guess I was just so curious about uh, Chris's um, perspective on this process. I don't know if further discussion can happen at some point about how it can improve. Um, can that, or is that just not, not something that's easily put on the table? How to improve what? The, the process, the application process, the qualifying, um, providing meaningful feedback, uh, and, and his, his remarks on the, the math and all of that. Go ahead, sir. Uh, we are going to be um, reviewing the discretionary grant process, uh, you know, the competitive grant process through codification. So I think that's the opportunity. And then um, in November, when Thank we you. meet again, I think there'll be an opportunity to look at an updated scoring rubric uh, as well. And maybe the RFP language, if the committee wants to just look at it, if it reflects um, any changes or reflects what the feedback was, or if there's any room for adjustments at that time. So we have a few, we have a little bit of time to, to refine it. I, I want to at least say, you know, lest any comment I make be confused for criti criticism of the staff, I, I just want to make sure you guys know I really am grateful for all your work and I know how much this really, how much work you're putting in and nothing I'm complaining about is directed at, uh, at your efforts and your, uh, your judgment. I have such esteem for your work. So anyway, all my appreciation. Agree. Yeah. Thank you. Anything further anybody would like to discuss? Okay, then we'll see everybody. What do we say? July 29th. <laughs> okay. next well, week. next week. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully we, we will have a good uh, outcome for Riverside. Well, it's July, so next month. We don't, the commission meeting. Oh, commission. Yes. That's right. We'll see everybody in June. <laughs> yeah. Everybody, please come to the commission meeting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much.